Hey there, Seth Cherapak here. Um, if you're looking for some thought-provoking reading that'll help you understand human behavior and human um, behavior as it applies to the evolution of civilization, um, politics, business, persuasion, anything that's related to human behavior and understanding how people think, particularly a person's axiology, um, which is the way that they value things and the way that they make value judgments and decisions, um, this reading list that I'm going to give you here is it's going to be absolutely phenomenal. You're absolutely going to love the reading suggestions that I give you. My name is Seth Cherapak. I'm a freelance writer. I've been writing advertising copy, copy for about 15 years. I also write on politics, human behavior, personal growth. And I have, over the past 20 years, been reading um, stuff related to understanding personal growth, human consciousness, um, the evolution of civilizations. Um, based on the way that people make decisions, you know, how that dynamic affects the evolution of civilizations, the rise and fall of civilizations, and also, um, you know, personal decision making processes, personal growth, um, the achievement of human potential. I've been, re I've been studying that topic for a very long time. I am what I call a practical axiologist. I study the, the methodologies that people use to make value judgments. And I believe that that's a driving force behind our lives because our decisions shape our lives and our collective decisions shape our society. And so the books that I'm going to give you, most of them are related to those specific topics. I've got a couple of that I kind of snuck in here that are on um, topics like writing because I, I like to write because I'm a writer. <laughs> that's what I do. But um, eventually at some point, if you study these ideas, you're going to want to talk about these ideas to other people. And I think developing the skill of writing is a good way to do that, even if you don't write even if you only write in a journal, because it helps you to develop your ideas in such a way to, to where they're more clear and persuasive to other people. Warning, do not watch this video if you've already got a reading list a mile long and are going <laughs> to email me saying, damn it, Seth, I've now got more stuff added to my reading list. You're going to have a whole lot more in just a minute here. I've read several thousand books on this topic, and I have just um, selected a pile of the, the ones that I can remember as being the most influential ones. I'll probably... Some will pop into my memory as I go through these, and I'll, I'll just mention those, so I may not have the physical book with me. But I'm going to do these in, I just kind of categorize these, so I'm going to go through them one category at a time. Starting with, let's see, what topic should we start with? Um, understanding human behavior and, uh, and consciousness. And by the way, when I use the word consciousness, I mean a person's state of mind, a state of perception. The word consciousness has kind of been hijacked by the New Age movement, and, and they've added all kinds of interpretational baggage to it that, in my opinion, doesn't belong within the container of the concept of consciousness, but unfortunately, that's, the, that's what they've done to it. I hate when people abuse language like that, but I'm going to be using that word because I still think that it's an accurate word to describe um, states of mind, states of being that people can move in and out of. So we're going to start with that, and there is a... Uh, I'm just going to grab the first one off the pile. There's an author who I recommend who is, um, he's really a personal growth related author, but I, I don't think you can study personal growth without studying consciousness, studying the mind, studying the, the uh, um, ability to move from lower states of consciousness to higher states. And when I say lower to higher, in, in scientific language, that would be moving from um, anxiety and um, ridden and competitive ways of thinking to creative and cooperative ways of thinking and transcendent ways of thinking in what the uh, the Eastern philosophers call enlightenment. Okay, so that's what I talk about. This is the first book you need to get a hold of if you really are interested in personal growth. The reason I say this is because this book, Safe People, um, it's about how to choose good relationships and get toxic people out of your life. It's a very short, very quick read, but it can save your life. And I'm not kidding about that. Um, toxic people can ruin your life. They can ruin your potential. They can destroy your self-esteem. They can waste your time and your energy and money. I know I've been through instances like that myself and you need to learn how to spot these people and, and keep them at a distance or stay away from them and to spot you know good relationships, friendships, business relationships. This is a fantastic book on the topic. It's by a Christian personal growth author named Henry Cloud. And he also works with a co-author named uh, John Townsend. If you're still dating, read this book before every date. I'm not joking about that. Another book by Henry Cloud, in, in my opinion, his best work is called Changes That Heal. And it's, in my opinion, the best personal growth book that's ever been written. 
I mean, it, it just, the profound impact that it had on my life and my clients' lives back when I was coaching and counseling was just almost unbelievable, including people who didn't think from a Christian mindset. He's a Christian author. He talks about that from that mindset quite a bit. But if you can look past that and grasp, you know, if you're someone who's turned off by those types of topics, but if you can look past that and look at the content and the principles that he talks about, it'll change your life. It's called Changes That Heal, and it's by Henry Cloud. The other one was Safe People by Henry Cloud. This is kind of a good follow-up book to both of those, How People Grow. And once again, this is Henry Cloud and uh, John Townshend. They're both doctors. Doctors like you say doctor before their name, so I guess i got to say Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. Townshend. Townsend. So um, on the on the sort of the flip side of that is this fella named Alfred Korzybski who wrote a book called Science and Sanity. Science and Sanity is a huge book. It's like an 800 volume book and a lot of it's written in kind of a stream of consciousness journal style writing but there's fabulous ideas in here. I mean really really good stuff if you want to learn to think more critically, think more rationally and more importantly understand the difference between language and the things which language describes. That might sound like a really obvious point, but I'm amazed at how many people um, who are interested in philosophy or who are just like to, like to debate really can't tell the difference between language and the things that they're using the language to describe. And once you um, make that realization, once you realize that those two are separated, it it's just like almost like getting in a helicopter and flying miles and miles above the earth or not miles and miles hundreds hundreds thousands of feet above the earth it it changes your perspective of the earth and of of I'm mean, sorry of society and of people in a way that you you can't change back after it and it's it's a little frustrating in in one way because people who don't see things that way will argue um with you about things and they don't really realize that they're arguing with you about something that you're not arguing about <laughs> You know, like they're arguing semantics or they're arguing about concepts rather than arguing about principles. Um, in fact, you may not even be able to understand what I just said unless you've read this. I'm not trying to sound snotty or elitist, but this it changes the way that you look at the world. Um, this is selections from Science and Sanity because the other the book itself is 800 pages long and, in my opinion, unnecessarily crammed with a lot of just stream of consciousness type of thought. That book really condenses everything. If you want to skip that and, and grasp the concepts... Um, of general semantics, which, by the way, Alfred Korzybski is the author there. He's one of my um, Polish brothers. That's his name right there, Alfred Korzybski. He also wrote um, – he oh, no, one of his colleagues wrote a, a book called The Tyranny of Words that is also really good. If you're one of these people who is interested in what's called NLP, you need to read Alfred Krasipsky's works because the NLP people ripped this guy off. I'm sorry if you don't like that, if you're a fan of NLP, but they ripped him off. It was his idea originally, and I, in my opinion, he, he is much more practical and much more clear-headed in the way that he develops it. Um, these two people, their names are Susan Bresby Kodish and George I. Kodish, PhDs. I, I can't, I'm probably not saying their names right. There they are wrote this book called Drive Yourself Sane. And this is a practical application of the principles of, of general semantics which are talked about in Science and Sanity. And um, again, these are the people who are really the pioneers of what today is unfortunately called NLP. And I say unfortunately because those NLP people are really getting credit for somebody else's idea. That's which is one of the reasons I have a kind of a hostile um, perspective and attitude towards NLP is because I think they're just a bunch of charlatans. Even though what I think what they're teaching, um, a lot of it is good and true. They really just ripped somebody off, and they also they also took out the really important, hard hard to uh, accept components of it and kind of made it kind of uh, cartoonized it, kind of material. Uh, what do they call it? Commercialized it in a way that I think that it kind of lost a lot of its potency. If once you get past the um, the general semantics, once you've studied that, um, there are actually no. There's one more book. <clears throat> this this guy George Lakoff <clears throat> wrote this book, "Women Firing Dangerous Things." And no, the title is not sexist. He explains why he uses that title <clears throat> in the book, and it's actually a very reasonable explanation and a good explanation that's relevant to the book itself. As you can see, it's an extremely thick book. This is a very dry, very boring read. 
Okay, this is <clears throat> takes a lot of discipline and a lot of maturity to read this book. I disagree with a lot of this guy's um, <clears throat> his interpretations, but the data that he comes up, that comes up with that, through scientific experiment is sound and it's good stuff. And it basically takes the idea of general semantics to the next level, where he talks about the difference between our cognition and the things that we are cognating about, the things that we are thinking about, talking about, speaking about, conceptualizing about, and the things themselves. Once you make that separation, it opens up a whole new world for you when it comes to critical thinking, um, being able to spot deception, being able to spot irrational belief in other people. The only complaint I really have about this author is that he, he, wrote, he wrote another book called uh, Metaphors We Live By, which is another very, very good book. I'm going to give you his uh, his... George Lakoff, that's him. He is a uh, he wrote another book on politics where he tried to apply these ideas to the political mindsets of, of the right and the left. And in my opinion, he got it wrong. Um, I think the con the concept that he came up with is right. The metaphor that he came up with is right. But uh, he is one of those people who you can tell his political leanings. He, he does not do a very good job of of setting his bias aside and writing about it. He's obviously on the left hand side of the political spectrum. Not that I have a problem with people that think that way, but he he is not objective in his his work and his comments about politics. It's just it's kind of kind of sad, but um, his the rest of his work is is very 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 good. Once you get past um, have assimilated all the information I've talked about, and you want to really really dig in and get to the Superman level on understanding uh, the concepts that I just talked about, you got to get this book. This is the Structure of Value by a fellow named Robert Hartman. As far as I'm concerned, I've studied a lot of philosophers and read a lot of philosophical works. This guy is the wisest, um, smartest philosopher that ever lived. And his name is Robert Hartman. I know you've never heard of him, but that's how it works sometimes. This guy, if you read this book, I'm on my fifth read through it, and I still don't understand everything in it. The way that he communicates is so complex, and the ideas are so rich and so complex and help you understand um, the philosophy of axiology and of value so well that it, there's almost no other way he could have communicated them. One of my specialties is simplifying complex ideas. This book, in many places, is unnecessarily complex, and I don't think the author is doing it on purpose, but it's also a complex enough idea to where there's really no other way he could have written about it than to be this complex. So don't touch this book unless you're really, really willing to, to dive deep. Um, the Structure of Value by Robert Hartman. In my opinion, that is also why he never became popular, because he never found a way to commercialize his work, um, even to create like a gateway drug version of his work to get people interested in the deeper stuff. Um, at some point, someone like the NLP people is going to rip this guy's work off, and, and, and some people are actually trying to do that today. By the way, there's a lot of people who talk about this guy's work who when they start talking about it you can tell they haven't read the damn book and it frustrates the heck out of me but um because I, I think the guy deserves better than that he did a lot of work on it but anyway so it works sometimes but uh just a couple of uh, simpler readings on uh, human behavior this one's called spin selling this is another guy who um actually I just said another but I hadn't talked about that other guy first but so this is a guy who uh, did a lot of research into, by the way, in case you missed the last guy's name, it's Robert S. Hartman. I realized I didn't show you that, Robert S. Hartman. So anyway, back to spin selling. This is a guy who did a lot of research on how people really make buying decisions. I, I worked in a world of sales for a long time. I don't, I, sorry, I had to wait for the camera to catch up there. Um, I, I don't work in sales anymore, but when I did, this is really the only book that actually um, gave you an honest look at how sales is really done and how sales are really made. But why is it important to understand selling? Well, selling is so firmly attached to, to axiology and to human behavior. If you really want to know what someone values, look at where they invest their time, money, and energy. Everything else is just a theory. It's just a, something that they say, yeah, I think this is important. I think this is valuable, or I would buy this if I could, or I would do this if I could. If you really want to know what someone really values, you got to look at their behaviors in terms of where they invest their time, money, and energy. So if you understand the selling process and why people buy, that'll help you understand human behavior better. And this job does a terrific book of it because this book, <laughs> there goes my dys dyslexia. This book does a terrific job of it because this guy actually studied he 
went through thousands and thousands of sales calls and actually looked at them, the ones that did close and the ones that didn't, and found the common threads, and he wrote about it in this book. Um, very good stuff, especially if you are a copywriter. I have borrowed a lot from his work in in my work so um, on value mechanics. By the way, I'm not going to be telling you about my books in these videos because I thought that would be a little bit too self-serving, but I left the link to my website below this video in case you want to find those. The other one here is Food of the Gods, and I almost didn't know where to put this. I almost put it in the, the sacred and spiritual stuff, but just kind of an oddball book that doesn't really belong in any of the categories. This is a this is by a fellow named Terence McKenna. If you've already heard of him and don't like him and think he's controversial, just listen with an open mind for just a moment. This guy understands, um, this guy um, explains how he believes that psychedelic plants, which were used by ancient shamans um, in order to change a person's level of consciousness, he believes that that it's understanding those and how they were used by ancient humans helps us understand the Garden of Eden story. Whether you think he's right about that or not, and I'm not saying either way whether I think he's right, because that's a topic for another video. Whether you think he's right about that or not, you should still read this, because there's a lot of people out there um, who believe this and are spiritual seekers, but are also, um, you know, they might have political beliefs or religious beliefs that you disagree with, and you still want to be able to reach these people and talk to these people. You need to read this book. Not only that, It'll challenge the way you think about some things that you thought you knew. Um, he talks about something called the dominator mindset, the difference between the dominator mindset and the, uh, I think he calls it a nurturing mindset. I'm not sure, but what he's talking about, according to the ancient um, spiritual philosophers, is the difference between the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine. Again, if you're turned off by those terms, th that's fine. But I, I talk a lot about the uh, religious terminology and spiritual terminology used by people outside the Christian realm even though I'm a Christian, because I think it's important to understand how those people think. And not only that, um, I think you'd be surprised once you start to kind of look outside of your own bubble, how much better you understand your own religion and your own spiritual texts. And I'm going to be talking about that in just a moment by studying these types of things. So this guy actually believes that that when, a, when we assimilated whatever fruit of the tree of knowledge that it was that it changed our the epigenetic expression of our DNA in such a way to where it allowed us to think logically which if you've seen my my video on it I believe that the so-called knowledge of good and evil that it talks about in the Bible is logical thinking um, I know that's controversial but I explained it in the video that you'll find on my channel so this is a very 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 interesting book um, it'll also help you understand those people who want to um, legalize drugs and, mar and medical ma um, marijuana for recreational use. It'll help you understand those people better because they're not just stoners who want to sit around and watch cartoons and smoke pot all day. They actually have a philosophy and a culture, and it's rooted in this guy, his work, this book will help you understand it. So I think it's important to understand people who don't think like you because you want to be able to talk to them about what you believe is true. Um, you may end up being persuaded by him in the process, but that's how the truth works. Anyway, so let's move on to um, business-related books. Business-related books. Now, if you're not in the business world or if you're not in entrepreneurship, these can still help you understand human behavior. And so I'm covering the founding papers of the, of the United States, including the Constitution, um, Bill of Rights, other documents in here, because really the way that the United States was set up was kind of like the way that the business or organization was set up. It had a set of, of constitutional bylaws, a set of principles that we use to govern ourselves and that we all have consented to a bit behave according to in order to build a civilized society. There are probably some of you watching this who, th who think, like, well, weren't there a lot of bad people um, who were involved in, in well, not bad people, but people who were involved in, in drafting these documents who were doing some not so nice things like slavery? Sure there were. Um, but that doesn't mean that the ideas that are in here are wrong. Um, it, you have to judge the ideas by their merit themselves, not by the person who's writing them. That's a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow, but there's some some really insightful stuff in here about how to manage civilization in such a way to where it blocks out the possibility of tyranny. These guys knew what they were talking about when it came to that. They did some not so nice things in their personal life, but they did understand um, a lot about how to um, block us from being taken over by timers, which is one of the reasons, one of the only reasons I believe that the United States is still, knock on wood, a, 
I, I don't even believe in that. I don't know why I said that. But it, why, it still is not been taken over by tyrants yet. So anyway, there's that. Next one, um, Thomas Edison, As I Know Him. This book is written by Henry Ford, who was someone who knew Thomas Edison. And um, by the way, sorry, I forgot to mention this one, Food of the Gods by Terence McKenna. Okay, forgot to mention that one by name. Anyway, back to this one. Uh, we hear a lot about Thomas Edison, but what we don't hear is why Thomas Edison was as rich and as famous and as successful as he was. It had nothing to do with his ability to invent. It had to do with his ability to market ideas and to get his ideas into people's minds. And this book will help you understand a side of Thomas Edison you never knew existed. And if you're a marketer or entrepreneur or someone who likes to sell your ideas and debate in the, in the public idea uh, marketplace of ideas, you need to understand how Thomas Edison did it. Really quite brilliant. Um, and he wasn't such a nice guy, if <laughs> you find out from reading that. He was really... He manipulated quite a few people, but um, he did some things that were smart and some things that were not smart, just like any other human being. On that note, another book that I um, – this has really been a game changer for me is, is The 48 Laws of Power by Dr. Robert Greene, The 48 Laws of Power. He wrote another book called Seduction and another one called, I think, The Art of War. I didn't like those ones too as, as much, but this book – really helps you understand the, the dark side of human nature and how people who are megalomaniacs, are power-hungry people, manipulate good people in order to get into positions of power. There's a quote in the beginning of this book that says, the person who tries to be good all the time will ultimately come to ruin among the many people who are not good. And I think that that's a universal law of life. If you're, if you're not willing to, um, when someone attacks you or tries to take your freedom away from you or tries to oppress you or lie about you or besmirch you, much in the way that the modern media does to people, if you're not willing to hit them back and hit them hard, then you're going to be crushed by them. And that, that's just the world that we live in. This guy really helps you understand that dynamic very, very well. If nothing else, this book is a great supplement to this book that I mentioned earlier, Safe People, because it helps you understand how um, power-hungry people behave, how they manipulate people. If you read this book and you grasp the things that are in it, um, you'll be people won't be able to manipulate you because you'll be able to see past their ruses. So um, very good book there, especially um, useful in the business world, I think useful in your personal life as well. Another one that I think is kind of a fun little book is the Decision Book. This has just a bunch of little models for um, that will help you to you know challenge the way you think. They're kind of like puzzles, except for that they're useful. Um, I'll just give you a really simple one in here. It's called the Decision Book. It's by – oh, goodness, I can't say that guy's name. It's by this guy, <laughs> Michael Krogeris and Roman Schapler. Sorry, I know I'm butchering his name, but um, anyway, it's 50 Models for Strategic Thinking. You can probably look it up by that, the decision book. Very quick little book, but I'll just show you one of the, one of the um, models in here. It has this guy who's being pulled by something and being pushed by something, and the question is what's pushing you and what's pulling you. Usually when you, or, or what's pushing you, I'm sorry, what's pulling you and what's holding you. In other words, when you, when you have an opportunity to, to reach for a new um, opportunity in your life, oh, it's redundant, um, move into a new relationship, new job, whatever it is, and let go of something old, you're going to have something that's holding you back and you're going to have something that's hold, um, calling you to go forward. And this model, really the way that he talks about this, the authors talk about this, help you to understand that dynamic and how to kind of you know get some insight, get some altitude as far as um, perspective on it. So there's, this book is just full of cool little models. I just love to kind of leaf, pick it up and leaf through it occasionally and just look at the stuff and, and think about something in a different way. It's um, kind of a nerdy thing that I like to do. So anyway, there's that. Um, there's another business author who I have a tremendous amount of respect for. I, he actually wrote the foreword for one of my books. And he's a in my opinion, an underrated business writer. He actually is a very well-respected, but in a very small circles of uh, very savvy marketers who understand um, 
understand the concepts that he talks about. If you're someone who reads business or personal growth books and is just tired of fluff and BS and people who um, tell you things that sound really great on paper but aren't really useful, this is the guy you need to read. His stuff at times is, is hard to read. It might offend you, but he is just raw, real. And when you read his books, when I read his books, it's it's almost like, wow, I, I kind of knew that all along, but I was just, uh, I, I, I had that intuition beat out of me. People managed to convince me that the world worked different than it really did. And this guy kind of comes along and knocks on your door and says, hey, here's how the world really works. And you know this. Now, you know, get your head out of the clouds and start acting right. That's really the way that this guy writes. And in my opinion, he's very, very funny. I have a sarcastic sense of humor. If it's sarcastic and irreverent sense of humor, just like him. So maybe you don't appreciate the type of sense of humor. But um, if you can handle that, the stuff in these books are very good. I'm just going to mention some of his best ones. No BS Wealth Attraction in the New Economy. Um, this is his response to that whole secret law of attraction thing, um, which I think the, the way the people – I respect some of the people in that law of attraction movie, but a lot of them, they just really serve your dessert without your vegetables. I think it, it was uh, – it was good for introducing an idea to people, but for for people who will not go past the, uh, the the sort of commercialized version of the idea, it's very unfortunate because I think it's doing people a disservice. But anyway, this guy's response to it is just phenomenal because it really talks about some things that some of those New Age Law of Attraction people won't talk about or they um, they will try to sort of reposition to make it sound a little bit friendlier and a little bit more nice and fluffy. And he just gives it to you straight. Another one, this is about managing people. Ruthless management of profits and people. This is if you want to just really get no nonsense about managing people and do it the right way. Um, he wrote another one called Making Them Believe. This is, this is a controversial topic that he writes about in this book. It's about a fella who made a career out of, and I'm not kidding about this, he made a career out of selling men goat testicle implants as a means of overcoming infertility. Now, you may think that that's totally ridiculous and totally immoral thing to do. I understand that. But the methodologies that this guy used to market himself, you need to know about for the same reason you need to know about the things that I talk about here in this book and in this book, Safe People. Because this book really teaches you how manipulation works, how persuasion works. And I'm telling you that a lot of people out there who talk about persuasion don't know what they're talking about because they're not willing to talk about the hard things that are in this book, <coughs> Making Them Believe uh, by Dan Kennedy. So interesting book there. Another one I, I like by him is No BS Time Management. Um, and it's, it is what it says. It's about how to manage your time and energy better. This one, this is very interesting. He actually sent me this one as a gift when I wrote a review in one of my newsletters for his book, um, No BS Wealth Attraction, Trust-Based Marketing. He talks about really how to position yourself as a person of authority and a, a person of high authority within your niche. If you're a freelancer or if you're even out there looking for work in the, in the professional marketplace, those are all books you need to get a hold of. Um, so a couple more business books here. This book is called Positioning, and it's by a fellow named, it's by two guys named Jack Trout and Al Rees. I can't see, oh, there's Al's name. They, they would probably be all artsy and put them in weird places on the, on the um, cover. It's called Positioning. There's another book that kind of goes along with it called 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing. There are predictions that these guys made in these books that didn't they didn't pan out the way that they thought they were going to, but no one's right all the time. The underlying idea that they talk about in this book is it's one of those things that act, that really did change my life. It changed the way that I thought about marketing. They talk about how to get an idea into somebody's mind and the obstacles to getting ideas in people's mind. The concept in this book, I'm not even going to tell you what it is because if you hear me say it, it's going to sound so simple you're going to think you already know it. But I promise you that you don't unless you've read these books or other books by these authors. Positioning and 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing. Very um, good, timeless ideas. You know, some of some of you might be watching these and thinking, well, these are kind of old books. Do these, do these books still apply? Um, do the principles in them still apply? <coughs> are they still relevant in modern times? 
there are some ideas, some principles that never go out of date. They may change the way that they express themselves, um, you know, through our through their, our collective consciousness or our our societal evolution. But the, the principles themselves don't change. And this is one of those books that talks about those things. These two books, speaking of what I just said, Good to Great and How the Mighty Fall by Jim Collins. These books have received a lot of criticism for what I believe is a very dumb, dumb reason. Um, this is this guy, I've always felt a, a kinship with this author and his work because I was a business coach and did a lot of coaching for several years before I discovered this guy's work. And was it was eerie the way that the stuff that he wrote about in this book was similar to the stuff that I had started to write about based on my experience in business. But I guess that's how universal principles work. You know, they're people are, are going to stumble across them whether they live on one side of the different sides of the globe from another or not. And so he and his team did decades of research on businesses that had experienced explosive and sustainable growth and he wrote about those principles in his book. There's stuff in here that is extremely counterintuitive. There's stuff in here that you're going to read and think, oh, well, that's totally different than all the stuff that I've read in the other leadership books that I've read. But like I said, the, the personal growth space is full of so much BS. And I believe that's because a lot of people try to um, carve a reputation out of writing about the things when they've never actually done the things themselves. They just try to say, hey, I can write about this topic. And they read a bunch of other books on this topic by other people who have never done the t done the stuff themselves, but have just written about it. And it's kind of like this dilution of information. <laughs> well, I think most personal growth and business books are like that, especially stuff out on the internet. This guy actually did his research, and so the stuff that you hear in this, read in these books, it's going to be so different than what you've read out there that you may want to put the book down in the first place or, or when you first read it. But um, you know. The really life-changing revelations tend to be like that. The reason I recommend the second book, How the Mighty Falls, he goes back and responds to his critics many, many years later because a lot of people read the book Good to Great and said, hey, a lot of those companies went out of business. Yeah, you were wrong. But as it turned out, when you read How the Mighty Fall, he explains how those companies stopped doing the things that made them successful and did the things that inevitably caused an organization to fall. If you want to understand, by the way, on a side note, the, the, the fall of the collapse of the two political parties in the United States, what's happening to the Democrat and Republican Party, read this. It's very interesting. I'll give you an interesting perspective on it. By the way, that idea about a company becoming successful and then and then ceasing to do the things that made them successful is one of the things that Dan Kennedy talked about in his work, this guy. So two really good works. I saved the best one for last in regards to my business books. Um, this is Stephen Covey's crowning work. It's better than Seven Habits for Highly Effective People. Most people I talk to, including people who read Stephen Covey's work, have not read The Eighth Habit. You have to read this if you're interested in business and interested in leadership. But you especially want to read this if you, under, you want to understand actually what happened during the transition out of the industrial period and into the information age, which happened around the uh, turn, of this, turn of the century here, around the 2000s. This guy wrote this book in 1995, and as far as I'm concerned, <coughs> it's practically a prophetic, prophetic prediction about what happened decades later after this book was written. It is phenomenal to go back and read this book and say, and see him say, here's what I think is going to happen, and here's what actually did happen. Stephen Covey's been dead for a while, um, but he, you know, this book, he really, really had a handle on what was going to happen during the information age. And the reason he was able to make those predictions, by the way, is because he understood principles instead of understanding trends. So I talked just a moment ago about how some books never go out of date. They never go out of date because they're based on principles. People who understand principles can make these types of predictions because they're not so busy chasing trends. They understand the principles that drive those trends. <coughs> Very good business book. There's probably a couple of other business books I didn't mention there, but um, those are the ones that I can remember right now. So next I'm going to move on to books that deal with the study of consciousness, information, and the um, ultimate source of reality. Information as the ultimate source of reality. You hear a lot of the New Age people talking about this, and again, I think they're butchering the idea, but some of them 
are actually talking about some things that are interesting. I believe that the um, the, the source of the universe is not actually an, an, an object. I think that modern scientists, the way that they're looking for an object as the uh, to explain where the universe comes from is leading them in the wrong direction because I think that the source of the universe actually is not an object but a function. In other words, it's not something that can be described by a noun but can be described by a verb and that is absolutely consistent with what's written in the in the Bible and in the ancient Upanishads and in the uh, ancient uh, writing of the Taoists, um, the Buddhists, all those people, even the ancient um, occult philosophers talked about this. Now, I know some of you may be uncomfortable with that, but uh, you know, people stumble upon the truth even if they don't even if they don't uh I guess truth is truth regardless of where it comes from, okay? I I do believe that there is an objective truth, you know, and and I I talk about that in other videos, but you know, you can be studying a a completely irrelevant topic, a topic which is irrelevant to the way that things really are, you know? And you can stumble across real principles and real ideas that are actually true. And so you can find um, <coughs> little bits of, of truth and, and um, natural principle in just about any type of work. So that's why I'm not afraid to read this type of stuff. That said, there are some people that I've read that have really helped me to get a better grasp on understanding how um, in, in the, the origin of the universe is an information process. Um, they talk about in the first book of John, they call it the Logos. The the, the ancient <coughs> Taoists call it the Tao. Um, it's what I believe Jesus was talking about when he talked about God the Father. It is consistent with Christian scripture for those of you, my friends who are Christians, who are flipping out because I'm saying this. It is consistent with it. I talk about that in other videos. But if you want to really understand that phenomenon, um, here's a couple books that I've read that I think are interesting. This is called Power Versus Force. It's by... Uh, this guy named David R. Hawkins. <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff in this book I disagree with that I think is logically fallacious, but there's a lot of very good stuff in here too. One particular thing that I like in here is his chapter on the different levels of consciousness. And by levels um, of consciousness, I mean you, you can also interpret these in terms of brain waves, right? For instance, he talks about being in a state of grief, anxiety, anger, and then he, he goes all the way up the ladder um, to, you know, uh, pride, love, joy, uh, rationality, and finally all the way up to enlightenment, which is like the top rung of the ladder. And he unpacks and explains this development of consciousness and this, this expansion of consciousness probably better than just about any other author um, I've ever read. And if you read his work, it gives you an interesting new perspective on that that uh, passage from from Second Peter, where it talks about add to your faith knowledge, add to your add to your faith virtue, your virtue knowledge, your knowledge self control, so on and so forth. So that's a very good book. Interesting thing about this book is <clears throat> it was the answer to a question that I had been asking in my own mind for weeks before I found the book. Many of these books actually came to me that way. I was I was kind of thinking about this idea, and I was thinking, I wonder if this is really an idea that people have thought about or write about, or if there's someone who has some details that I can read about this idea. And it was an idea that I kind of thought that I came up with, but I was kind of thinking, well, you know what, someone's probably thought about this. Someone somewhere is probably writing about it. Well, then I was <clears throat> uh, with my wife and her friends in, uh, in California in an old bookstore and saw this title, Power Versus Force, and it just popped. It just like stood out to me. And I read it, and I was like, wow, this is exactly what I've been um, asking about, if there's something written on this. So very interesting, interesting, interesting right there. Um, on that same note, on the, uh, the idea of understanding information processing as the source of, uh, of life and the source of material things, there's a lot of scientific validation, scientific study that's behind this idea. And one of them is written about in this book called Grammatical Man by Jeremy Campbell. It's an old book, an old read. Um, it's kind of thick in some spots, but it's it's just it helps you to get a grasp on this from a rational, scientific uh, mindset. Um, it's talking about information entropy, language, and life. Now, all I would have to do is see that tagline: information entropy, language, and life, and I'd be giddy to read this book. If you want to really dive deep into that topic a little more after reading that one, 
There's this one called Int Introduction to Information Theory by John Pierce. By the way, grammatical man is Jeremy Campbell. This book, don't read this unless you are really interested in mathematics and extremely uber geeky stuff. I mean, this is, this is, uh, it's, it's hard, it's a hard read. Kind of like I talked about with, uh, did I already talk about him? I think I already talked about Robert Hartman. Yeah, it's a very hard read. You don't have to read it, but if you really want to understand the mathematical um, language that helps people understand the processing of information, this is a very, very good book to read. Um, sort of a more fun twist on it is this one, The Jazz of Physics. And this is actually by a guy named Stephen Alexander. He's a jazz musician and a physicist. And this book will blow your mind. <laughs> it really will. Um, but I'm going to pair it up with this one, Sync by Stephen Strogitz. This is one of my favorite books. I've read this many, many times. The reason I'm covering these together is because in Sync he talks about <coughs> he talks about how everything in the universe, and this is a scientist. Okay, this is not New Age woo woo. This is a scientist. Um, he talks about how everything in the universe living and non-living has an um, an intrinsic drive to come into sync with other things that are vibrating on the same frequency or moving at the same uh, at the same frequency what I mean by that is if you go to YouTube which are probably on right now and you search for metronomes syncing or ticking in sync or syn metronome synchronizing you'll find dozens and dozens of videos of people putting metronomes those little ticky things that musicians use on tables and the metronomes will be ticking at the same speed but they'll all be ticking sort of in different you know haphazard directions but if you sit them there and don't touch them and let them just tick it sometimes will take several minutes depending on how many there are they will begin to tick in harmony either like this or like this it's really really spooky and uncanny there was a fella that he writes about in this book who sat down uh, who was sick for months inside his his ship <clears throat> and he was he had these two clocks on the wall and was watching them and they were sort of ticking out of unison with one another and, and as he watched them over a period of hours they started to tick in harmony either swinging together like this or swinging together like this and it was really weird for this guy and he kept resetting them he kept you know putting them back to where they were out of sync and they kept synchronizing and he realized that the vibrations of the clocks ticking, the vibrations were being conducted through the materials that were between the clocks, like the wall, the floor, the chair, and were, and were actually interfering with one another. The vibrations of those those ticks were interfering with one another in, su in such a way to where they were coming into sync and ticking together. Non-animate objects do this. And this guy in this book explains how this is how lasers are made. This is how fireflies, if you've ever watched a, um, a, a group of fireflies, like even hundreds, thousands and thousands of them, they won't flash like this. They'll flash either like this or see how this one's going twice as fast as this one, but they're still sort of syncing up because every other time that this one flashes, this one flashes, that's sync. And Fireflies, which are all in the same environment, even if they're they're flashing at different frequencies or at different rhythms, out of sync with one another, they will synchronize. The pacemaker cells in our heart work this way. The reason our heart beats the way that it does is because there's thousands or probably millions of pacemaker cells that sync up this way. He talks about all the things in nature that emerge as a result of this synchronization. Now, this guy talks about how he believes that that same type of phenomenon is the cause of the emergence of large-scale structures like stars and planets. It's, it's not the, the, the structure itself has a, a, has a property which is the result of many, many, many small particles coming together and vibrating at, uh, at a harmonious frequency and causing the emergence of this large-scale structure. And I... I That'll take your nerdiness to new levels. I'm, I'm going to try not to get into that too much, but this, these two books, if you're interested in those types of topics, especially if you're one of these law people who are tired of this candy, uh, sort of candy store version of the law of attraction and really want to understand the science behind it and how 
works and how it applies to what people call the mind of God or the Logos or the Tao or whatever, read these two books. <clears throat> Last one on that topic. I didn't really know where to put this, but this is a book about epigenetics. Now, I don't talk to many people about this book because the, the theory of evolution, the theory of Darwinian evolution, is so there's so much emotion um, around that on both sides of, of the argument, right? The people who believe in it and the people who don't believe in it, that you almost have to be careful who you talk to because they'll turn on you like a rescue dog if you say the wrong thing. But this book, um, the epigenetics is basically, think of it this way. Our, our DNA is an information system. It's kind of like a, a database full of information. But the way that that, the way that that information expresses itself, the way that it processes depends on your epigenetics. An epigenetics is kind of like the software. A software manipulates information in such a way to where it can um, change the output, right? Like the information that you see on your screen right now because of this video is actually there's an information process behind it. There's a software that is that is taking information and, and delivering it to you in a way that causes this image to pop up on your computer. Well, <clears throat> our DNA has that type of software within it that changes the way that our DNA expresses itself. So this book actually explains how certain behaviors can not only affect the, um, your, bio, your physiology, but can also affect the physiology of your offspring because they can become encoded into the epigenetic software of your, of your DNA and passed on to your, your, um, uh, you know, your offspring. I can't think of a good word for that, so we'll just say offspring for now. But what I think is really interesting about this is there's there's verses in the Bible that talks about God visiting the sins of the fathers on the sons and daughters. This actually explains how that happens. In fact, the, that verse is actually in this book. This is not a religious person at all, but the reason I, I brought up this in relation to evolution is because our DNA is an information process, the same as the information processes that they, they talk about in these books here that I just brought up. By the way, in case you missed that, Stephen Alexander... Um, and that is Stephen Strogitz, both Stevens. And this book right here, so on and so forth. Those information processes, um, you know, the idea of Darwinian evolution, and I'm not talking about evolution, I'm talking about Darwinian evolution, is really, um, it, it's really only surviving, in my opinion, on anti-theistic sentiments. I mean, people who really want to use it to explain away the creator of the universe are kind of latching onto it, but they explain in this book, and actually some in this book as well, how the model of Darwinian evolution is really dead, and there's there are people who are are trying to figure out new ways to get at the problem because epigenetics does a better job of explaining it, which creates a lot of problems that we're not going to talk about in this video for Darwinian evolution, but. The one thing you'll find if you read this book and you start talking to people about epigenetics, and this is, this is extremely frustrating, but um, there's the epigenetics is a new enough idea in the scientific realm that people are using the word epigenet epigenetics to talk about things that really aren't epigenetics. <laughs> they talk about that in this book. And so when you get to debates with people about it, they'll be like, yeah, I know how epigenetic works, and they'll go on and on about it, and you can tell that they really haven't done their homework. You just have to stay away from those people. But it is a little frustrating once you understand this because people who don't understand it think they understand it because the word has been misused. As a writer, that really smokes my balls, but you know what? What are you going to do? Um, we live in an imperfect world. So moving on from, from that, this book, I, I'm going to move on to books that are about the cause and effect um, I, don't, I almost don't even know how to say this. I, I want to say the evolution of civilization and society, but the writers that I'm going to present to you here, they really have an interesting way of following the chain of cause and effect and understanding how um, civilizations rise and fall. Rising, falling, sink. <laughs> um, never mind. I'm not going to go off on that. But anyway, they talk so this is talking really about how human behavior manifests itself on a societal level and how we move from different eras of um, like the industrial area, um, the agricultural era to the industrial era to the information age and how human behavior, the relationship between human behavior and technology drives that evolution and transition. This one, I almost didn't know where to put this book. This is The True Believer 
by Eric Hoffer, and it's thoughts on the nature of mass movements. I want to say this almost relates to the um, this stuff that I talked about before in 48 Laws of Power, because it talks about how people get sucked into um, cult-like thinking and mass movements in a way that causes them to behave and believe irrationally. Another author who wrote about this is a, is a lady named Hannah Arndt. She wrote a book called, she wrote on the banality of evil and the origins of totalitarianism. She has several books. Her name is Hannah Arndt. She's actually one of my favorite philosophers who also wrote about this phenomena. This is another book that if you read it and understand the things in it, you're going to find that there are a lot of people who talk about this book and use it as kind of a conversation piece who they haven't read it. You can just tell by the way they talk about it, haven't read it. Unfortunately, out there in the political conversation, you'll hear people say, you reference this book as kind of like a, a prop to prove their point. Like people say, well, the radical left is really just explained by Eric Hoffer's work on the true believer. And then people over on the other side of the conversation are going to say, well, the radical right conservative alt right movement is proven by the, and they'll, they'll, they'll bring this book up, but they really haven't read it because if you start talking to him about it, you'll realize that, wait a second, if you'd read that book, you probably wouldn't be saying that. So uh, just one of those things. But it really helps you understand how people get sucked into cult-like thinking. My new book that I'm co-authoring with Dr. Kim Metcalf is actually about this topic as well. There's another author who writes about this called Arthur, his name's Arthur Dykeman. Arthur Dykeman is interesting because I think one of his books is called Reflections on a Blue Vase. Arthur Dykeman talks about how the human mind can be manipulated by changing a person's level of consciousness from a uh, uh, you know a healthy, cooperative, creative consciousness down to an anxiety, fear-ridden type of consciousness. And when you're in that state, it makes you more susceptible to irrational ideas. He does a really good job at explaining that. Um, it also explains a lot about the uh, the political division that we're seeing today. So, True Believer, very interesting book there. This one, if you're a human being who's gonna, who's planning to live for the next 20 or 30 years, this is a book you need to read. It's, it's a it's a thick book. The guy who wrote this is, in spite of being a very intelligent scientific person, is also very cult-like in his commitment to what he thinks artificial intelligence is going to do. To this guy, in my opinion, artificial intelligence is like a religion for this guy. But if you want to understand the new atheist movement and the, uh, <clears throat> the people who are thinking along the lines of transferring our consciousness to machines, um, they're not going to be able to do that, by the way. If you read these other books that I've told you about, you'll know why. But they believe they're going to be able to. And the argument that he unpacks in this book is it can be easily debunked by the books I talked about earlier that talk about consciousness, but <laughs> there's a lot of people who don't haven't read those things, don't know about them, and actually believe that we're going to be able to do some pretty weird and disturbing stuff with artificial intelligence. So, you know, we're headed for another transition out of the um, information age and into the age of artificial intelligence, the age of um, mechanical consciousness, whatever you want to call it. And you need to know about this because it's coming, you know, whether we like it or not. And, and this book really helps you get into the minds of the people who think like that. Um, another author, another book that I really like, Stephen Johnson's How We Got to Now, Six Innovations That Made the Modern World. He talks about <clears throat> the inventions which had the most profound impact on the evolution of human society. And although he doesn't purposely do that in this book, he also, if you read this other stuff that I've been recommending to you along with this, in reading this book, you start to understand the way that these technologies also change the way that we think, the way that we conceptualize about certain things. And there's revelations that you're going to come to when reading this book or watching the series because it's there's a PBS series called How We Got to Now. And if, by the way, if you watch the series, you're going to get everything you get from the book. I, I, I like to watch the series. The series is interesting. But um, it, when, you, when you view this through the lens of understanding human behavior and consciousness the way that we've been talking about, you're going to understand that we've really been disoriented and that uh, the, a lot of the ways that we think about reality and the things that we believe about reality are wrong. Um, at a fundamental level and in, in such a way to where they're so wrong but they're so familiar to us that it really takes a lot of reading and discovery and thinking to realize how wrong we are and once you do 
it's almost like getting in, like I said before, getting into a helicopter and and flying thousands of feet above the earth and getting an entirely new view of the landscape. Um, that's what reading these types of things will do for you if you understand um, the, the things that we've talked about in these books. So this, if you don't have time to read all this book or to watch all the series, videos in the series, check out the one on time, on the invention of time and how disorienting the invention of clocked time was on people. Time is not a very new clocked time is not a very new concept and the concept of time people often um, confuse the concept of time in other words the things which we use to measure um, motion entropy and growth which is this this concept called time they confuse the concept of time with the thing that it measures and causes them to believe in all kinds of weird stuff like the possibility of time travel um, and you guys who know me know that I don't believe time travel is possible because I don't believe that time is a material through which we can travel but we have been fooled into believing those types of things by our relationship with clocked time. But also our understanding of time, I think, has, has really changed the way people think about the origin of the universe and about God and about religion in a way that it's almost impossible for some people to change back because they're so immersed in these cultural metaphors. And if you read this book, you'll see what I'm talking about as long as you've, been, you know, you've read the other stuff that I've talked about along with it. Another person who talks about the evolution of, of a civilization is this guy, Jared Diamond, who wrote Guns, Germs, and Steel. Jared Diamond, he also wrote this one called Collapse. Guns, Germs, and Steel talks about the, um, the rise of powerful civilizations and empires. This talks about the collapse of them. Um, this guy comes at this from a, from a very narrow mindset, in my opinion. He talks a little bit too much about, um, you know, geography and natural resources and, and our effect on the climate and things like that. And he doesn't talk, in my opinion, enough about the cultural axiology that causes self-destructive behaviors. But I still think you should read these books because it has this, it, it's just this chain of cause and effect that he unpacks and follows and, and explains how, we really got to where we are right now and why it is that there are certain races that seem to dominate the entire globe. Um, gosh, that made me think of something I really want to talk about, but I won't. Anyway, so those two books. Um, <clears throat> then this one. If you want to understand, this is called The Making of the Modern University, and it's by Julie Rubin. Julie Rubin. To this day, I don't know what this woman's worldview is, and in my opinion, that makes her a very, very good and objective author. When you read this, all she really does is follows the, um, you can call it evolution or de-evolution, depending on what your worldview is, but she follows the change that has been made in the modern American university system and, and higher education system from being a very theological, um, God-centered, Christian-centered um, uh, approach to education to being a very secular and I don't care if you which side of that argument you're on you should read this you should it's it's very interesting to see the way that they tried to dislodge themselves from that theological center and tried to replace um, well first of all they just thought they could dislodge themselves from it and they'd be fine but then they realized hey wait a second we lost something when we got rid of that we need to try to replace it so they try kind of go through all these social experiments within the universities to try to replace this. And in the end, they realize that they really can't, <laughs> they, they cannot replace the, um, the value that a religious narrative brought to the understanding of morality and the, um, the aggregation of different disciplines like the arts, the sciences, so forth. And listen, I, I'm not saying that that can't be done, okay? Um, I don't care which, again, which side of the argument you're on. It's simply interesting to see how people who who didn't want any longer to belong to the religious worldview said, okay, well, we'll we're going to just leave this behind and realize, hey, wait a second, we can't exactly do that. We need to replace it with something, and it haven't they haven't managed to do it yet. And this book explains very well how that happened. And to this day, I really can't tell which side of the argument she's on just because this book is written so objectively, and a lot of it is really just letters between the people who who ran these schools and so 
that's a that's a, a game changing book there in my opinion. The Making of the Modern University by Julie Rubin. Not a very talked about. Uh, this book is not talked about very much. Um, <clears throat> it's one of those gems that is just kind of hidden away in a corner somewhere that you um, that I discovered and I think is very important. I think it should be more popular than, than it is, but isn't. But it does help you understand. Um, if also if you want to understand where the social justice movement came from that book will help you understand it so moving on I'm going to get to books about well you know I'm going to save the books about writing for last talk about books about spiritual subjects spiritual spirituality religion my favorite topic obviously the collection of books known as the Holy Bible I read the King James Version I I also read and speak ancient Hebrew or Hebrew and I study ancient Hebrew in my opinion in my opinion the only way to really understand the Bible is to is to study Hebrew you know I know some people don't like to do that but all you have to really do is learn enough Hebrew to know the first four chapters of the book of Genesis and you can really grasp the foundation of the Christian religion by by grasping that I don't really think you can understand it without understanding Hebrew I know how that sounds to some of you, but I adopted that belief after after I actually studied Hebrew myself and realized, wow, I cannot believe how much I was missing. So, I mean, we're talking about the difference. We're not just talking about the difference between in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashemayim be'et ha'aretz. There's more than just the, the the language that makes a difference. There's the cultural metaphors, the cultural assumptions that are baked into the language itself. Um, a lot of the time I found when people look even at the Hebrew words, they come to it with a Western understanding, a Western cultural metaphor, a Western um, f frame of mind. And if you study, um, where's that book that I brought up earlier? This book, George Lakoff on categorical thinking, you'll understand how, how big of a mistake that is to, to copy and paste our cultural assumptions onto these ancient languages. So anyway, I like the book of Genesis, the book of Proverbs, um, for obvious reasons. And you know, I think a lot of people like Proverbs. The book of Job really helps you understand the answer to the problem of suffering or the problem of evil or the problem of pain. A lot of people don't like the answer in the book of Job, but it tells you what the answer is from a theological worldview. Um, I also like the book of Jonah because, in my opinion, that's a prophecy of, of Jesus' um, death and resurrection as Jesus talks about you know, the sign of Jonah. Then there's the book of Daniel, which helps you understand the intertestamental period and the uh, the last day prophecies about the, the first coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ. Book of Revelations also really helps you understand uh, the rise of what people are calling the New World Order or the European Union, you know, the, the one world government, whatever it is. That's not a conspiracy theory, by the way. Um, there are people talking about a one world government. You may agree with it. You may disagree with it. But... That's predicted in the book of Daniel. Okay, it, it's weird and it's it's creepy if you don't believe in the Bible. I admit that, but you don't get to ignore it because you don't like the religion. I mean, it's just it's in there, and the the deeper you understand it, the more you realize that there's really no way to to deny it. It's just somehow this person knew that that was going to happen. Um, I believe it's divinely inspired. You may not, but anyway, still a very interesting reading. In in the New Testament, I like the books of uh, the Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, which I consider the fifth gospel. And then there's the book of Hebrews, which really helps you understand um, the nature of Christ, the Christian religion. You can really understand almost everything about the Christian religion by reading the book of Hebrews. I like the book of Jude because it helps you understand what actually happened in Genesis chapter 6, how the... Um, well, let me not get into that. It helps you understand Genesis chapter 6. And then, of course, there's the book of Revelation. Um, and I also like the book of Enoch, which is included in a lot of Bibles, including the Ethiopian Bible. So I read the book of Enoch in addition to that. Some people think that's blasphemy, but whatever. I mean, you guys don't know what you're talking about. I mean, anyone who thinks that those ex extra, some of those extra tes testamental books, like, um, like uh, the book of Enoch, which is quoted in the Bible itself, but is not in there, not in all versions of the Bible, but it's in some of them. If you guys out there who think that's satanic or whatever, um, I'd like you to explain to me why they quote those in the actual Bible itself. Right? So it's, I think those are valid historical references to go along with this. You may, not, you may not agree with that, but if nothing else, it'll help you understand the Christian religion better. Speaking of, I also recommend this, the Quran. 
I have I've read this book quite a few times and the reason I like to read this is because there's so much there's so much misunderstanding about the Islamic religion on both sides of the argument um, there's people who will just gratuitously say Islam is a religion of peace a religion of peace it's not I'm sorry if you read this and you read <laughs> And you read the guy, the how this guy um, lived his life, and how he used the philosophy in here. Which I think this is just as much a political book as it is a religious book. It's not a religion of peace. I'm sorry. Um, now there have been um, branches of Islam, sort of uh, like derivatives of Islam, that have come come along after it, much like the works of Baha'u'llah, which he wrote a book called the Seven Valleys. I think it's called Seven Valleys, Four Valleys. Maybe it's Seven Valleys, Three Valleys. Um, but it's by Baha'u'llah. It's the Baha'i religion. And he also wrote another one called, I think, the Holy Words or the Holy Persian Words or something like that. You can look it up on Google. But he really changed a lot about the Islamic religion and created a new religion which was much more friendly to women and is still kind of considered a branch of Islam. So when people are saying uh, Islam is a religion of peace, they may be talking about Sufi Muslims, which are more like mystics. Or they may be talking about the Baha'i religion, but um, they're not talking about what was originally written here. What was originally written here, the people who believe this normally are hostile towards the other two that I just talked about. And they're, they're not what I would consider peaceful people, mainly because they don't believe in separation of church and state. Whole, it's a whole other issue I don't want to get into too much. But it does help you understand because I think it's, I think it's important for people not to just demonize Muslims without reading this. But it's also not right to, to just defend them without reading this. You need to know what you're talking about. So that's why I recommend that people read that. Very interesting uh, stuff in there. Um, so this is another one that you may not consider a, a really a religious book. It's called The Consolation of Philosophy by Boethius. Um, I can't remember Boethius' first and last name, but he's an ancient philosopher from uh, ancient Roman philosopher, well, some people would call him Greek. That's a, that's a debate we can have later. But I read this when I was in my early 20s, and it changed my life. It, it really just, I was a diehard atheist when I was reading it, and I, I was going through a lot of BS, and I just decided I was going to read this guy's book because this guy, Boethius, was sent to prison to be executed. And while he was in prison, using only the resource of his own mind and his own reason and his own thinking, actually reasoned through um, and came to peace with his um, the, the people that had put him in prison and the thing that had put him in prison and came to peace with his own impending death. Um, and not in a passive way. I mean, he really, the revelations in this book are very, very interesting. I mean, it got me interested in thinking about religion again and thinking about God again. And it also made me realize that a lot of people who hate religion really or, or are turned off by religion are really turned off by the way religious people think and believe and that should never come between you and your search for the truth as far as whether or not God exists right that's between you and your creator um, if you let people get in the middle of that well then you're kind of allowing other people to interfere with that process so that got me thinking along those lines good book there I have a very sentimental relationship with this. In fact, this is my, my original copy. I found this in an old bookstore. It just kind of popped out at me and was like, I think I'll read that. And uh, changed my life. So anyway, um, here's another one that I picked up at Barnes & Noble. I can't, Ar Artello Marcello Pascual. Scriptures, Sacred Writings of the World Religions. This is this is more of like a uh, kind of a menu of that talks about the different sacred writings of the different religions around the world and helps you. What it really helped me do is understand which of those I wanted to study a little deeper because it's not going to tell you enough about it. If you base your understanding of these religions on what's written in this book, um, you're not ever going to understand these religions. But it does help you understand enough to know, hey, I think I'd like to look into that a little bit more. This actually helped me understand that there was a distinct difference between the different types of Islam that I talked about earlier. So this is kind of like a reference book that I like to use to uh, guide me in um, deciding which spiritual um, scriptures to read and next. This one is a very old copy of the writings of the, the essays of Ralph Waldo 
Emerson. I know he's a controversial figure, but most of the people who, who think this guy was a racist or this, all this other crap, or they don't understand him. They haven't read his works because he's misquoted so much and it's out of context so much. Some people also think that he's a, a, an occultist or he's blasphemous. There's terrible things said about this guy. And his works are really, really, really interesting. If you only have the opportunity to read a few things by him, I recommend The Oversoul Essay, Self-Reliance, and he also has History. His, his History Essay is really, I think, is a good introduction into his work. That's the first one you should read. After that, get into Self-Reliance and The Oversoul. And then, of course, um, Circles, I think, is very interesting read, too. If, if, you, if you really read history, self-reliance, and the oversoul, you get um, Emerson's philosophy. And his philosophy is based on a lot of the ancient Eastern religions, but it's also, you know, there's some threads of Christianity in it. I, I am of the opinion that the Eastern view of God is more in sync with the God depicted in the Bible than the Western view of God. And the reason I say that is because that holy, um, that whole... <laughs> My Freudian slip is showing. That whole idea of the bearded sky daddy on the throne in the sky, that's Zeus. That idea came down, trickled down into Christianity through the, the, the Greek pantheon. And that and a lot of the modern Western assumptions about God came through Greek thinking and is, is in my opinion, out of sync with what's actually written in the Bible. And that's why I say it's important to study the Hebrew because when you study the Hebrew, you start realizing that um, some of these books on the Eastern religions, which I'm about to talk about right now, are actually do a better job of explaining the nature of God the Father than a lot of the religious commentaries we read today. And a lot of people are offended at that and don't like it, but you'll see what I mean as you begin to study these original languages. So that said, Emerson is a guy who really helps introduce you to that idea in a very uh, a kind of modern and interesting way. So. Here's another book that you hear me talk about a lot. This is Wallace D. Waddles, The Science of Success. There's three books in here. There's The Science of Getting Rich, there's The uh, Science of Being Well, and there's The Science of Being Great. This is one of those books that the first few times I read it, I was like, this guy's full of crap. It's just garbage. But the more I read this, the more intelligent I realize this guy is. This is another author that has been hijacked by the New Age movement. Don't let their perception of him and the way they talk about him get in the way of you understanding this author. He really helps you understand Emerson's work better in very, very simple language. Um, in fact, you could read what this guy wrote and really get the essence of Emerson's teachings um, yeah, without ever reading Emerson. Although I think you should read Emerson anyway, just because he's fun to read. But then I have, I'm going to go through these really quickly. These are Eastern religious texts that I understand. These, these are the ten principal Upanishads of the Hindu religion. The translation is by this guy, the Swami... No, Sri Pirahit Swami and W.B. Yeats, the American poet. Those two worked together to create a translation of the Upanishads that is very simple but gets, but gets across all the ideas in the ancient Upanishads. I've read dozens of translations of the Upanishads and... Um, this is this is probably the best one for beginners and for really grasping the ideas. I do recommend that if you're going to study the Upanishads, look at several different translations and try to become familiar with the ancient language um, and culture as much as you can for the reasons I discussed earlier. But this has the ten most important Upanishads. If you only read the first two Upanishads, you really understand the whole philosophy of the um, no, the first two Upanishads and the sixth one, you really understand the whole philosophy of the Hindu religion. The conception of God, the concept of God they talk about in here, is more in sync with the God of the, the Old Testament than, than the um, depiction that we have in Western culture today, the bearded sky daddy God that I said comes from Zeus. That offends some people, and I'm sorry, but if you read this stuff, you realize that these people, even though they didn't have the whole picture, they knew something that we didn't know. <clears throat> they also made some very interesting predictions which have been validated by modern physics today in a very uncanny way. So another one is the Bhagavad Gita. Um, <clears throat> this is Perahit Swami. Sri Perahit Swami. Um, actually, it's the same guy. They just spell his name differently. The Bhagavad Gita really answers, is the Hindu answer to the, pro the, the problem of evil. And it's also um, the book about 
karma yoga. Now, karma basically just means the law of cause and effect. That karma, that word karma has been hijacked by our modern culture and, and made to mean something it doesn't mean. It just means the law of cause and effect, that's all. And karma yoga means the study of the law of cause and effect. So this is, this is a very uh, good book on that topic. Other one is the Dhammapada. This is the, um, they actually spelled this guy's name wrong, uh, the translator. I think his name is actually Max F. Fuller. I don't think it's even Max F. Miller or Muller. The Dhammapada. This is there. There are so many writings on Buddhism and so many different brands and branches of Buddhism that it's almost impossible to define what Buddhism really is. But this book, really, the Dhammapada, really, if you want to understand um, Buddhism, this is the book you want to read. There's some good stuff in here that actually, again, have been validated by these authors who have done work on human cognition, like this guy. There's something in the twin verses of the Upanishad, of the first two verses, that actually talks about how our experience is all created by our internal uh, processing of information. That doesn't mean the outside world doesn't exist. They talk about that too. But um, that's a keeper right there. Another one is the Tao Te Ching. And this is another book that has been used by occultists and um, misused, in my opinion, and has gotten a bad reputation because of that. But it might interest you to know that it, in the Christian Bible, in John chapter 1, when it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If you look at the Chinese translation of it, it says, In the beginning was the Tao, and the Tao was with God, and the Tao was God. The Tao that it talks about is this information processing, um, this, this, this thing, this process of processing information. That's really redundant, but we talked about that earlier. This... Um, thing which from which all creation comes is not an object but it's a process it's being itself that's why in uh, when when God talked to Moses in the burning bush he said I am that I am that word yeah he is being or coming into being it's a verb it's not a noun um, in this book they talk about it as the Tao and if you really want to get a grasp on the ancient Middle Eastern concept of God which is by the way um, Christianity is not a Western religion. It's a, it's a Middle Eastern religion. It came from the Middle East. So if you want to understand how the people who wrote the Bible, how the people in that area of the world thought, you need to understand the Eastern concept of God and that Tao Te Ching talks about this. Again, it's been hijacked by certain New Age people and people like Aleister Crowley, but the truth can be abused. And it has been in, in that respect. This is another book that's been abused the same way. The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. This is a, a more modern um, interpretation of how the principles that are written about in the Hindu Upanishads are practiced in practical life. The reason I got this, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, is by Charles Johnston. No, it's not by Charles Johnston. It's by Patanjali, but it's translated by Charles Johnston is to understand what yoga really is. Yoga is not has nothing to do with yoga mats and poses and all this other stuff. Yoga is actually the silencing and control of your conscious thought processes so that you can actually experience um, this higher level of awareness or, or transcendent thinking. Um, that's what it talks about in here. It's called Raja Yoga. Karma Yoga is the study of cause and effect. Raja Yoga is the study of mental states. It originally wasn't meant to be an exercise routine or even a religion. It was just a, a kind of like a personal growth book. A lot of ancient religions really are just philosophical personal growth type books that we've um, kind of uh, hijacked for certain religious purposes. And that's unfortunate, but that's what's happened. That said, there is another philosophy that comes out of ancient Egypt called Hermeticism, which has been hijacked by people in the light and the dark occult. And this guy writes about it in this book called The Kybalion. It says it's by the three initiates. It's really by a guy named William Walter Atkinson. Um, this is an extremely controversial book. Okay, If you want to understand New Age thinking, um, what's really behind it, not, I, no, let me not even say that because that, that's not even fair. This book is about... A philosophy it's kind of like a personal growth what we call today the personal growth philosophy but really talks about the control of certain mental states um, and it and it's based on the premise that the control of certain mental states um, uh, 
causes your life to become a certain way or to not become a certain way. In other words, your external circumstances are ultimately the amalgamation of your mental states over a period of time. Um, and it talks about how to control those. And, and it, some people have used this to justify New Age thinking, occult thinking, dark occult thinking. This book has been used and abused. <laughs> but if you really want to get to the root of where you know what people are borrowing from this is the book this is probably the most used and abused book by occultists people who believe in the occult um, if you really want to understand at the core where their thought process comes from as much as they've abused the information in this book this is the book to read um, so that, anyway that's it um, I want to include this in my list of recommended reading for spiritual books. It's Aesop's Fables. I know they're not considered spiritual, but if you want to introduce your your kids or um, you know to to first principles to these basic principles, I think Aesop, an ancient I think he's an ancient Greek philosopher, did a very good job of turning these into very simple children's stories. And there is stuff in here. I actually don't recommend that you try to read this and use it. And understand it until you read some of this other stuff because it's going to change the way you think about this stuff and this will give you an opportunity to use these little stories as conversation pieces to uh, present these ideas to other people especially kids because they're fun stories so um, that said kind of the adult version of that is this series the Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien um, when you start to study the other stuff that we've talked about and then you go back and read this book, you'll really see that this guy, whether he was consciously aware of it or not, understood these principles and told them in the form of a narrative story, an entertaining narrative story called The Lord of the Rings. And if you read Emerson's essay on history, you'll realize that as far as Emerson was concerned, you could learn about these natural principles which govern the evolution and the change of society in real life by reading fiction because the human consciousness has these embedded um, principles, the embedded ideas inside it, and they express themselves through fiction, but they also express themselves through our behavior in such a way to where our story actually tells a narrative which has the same principles embedded in it as historical, I, I mean, as fictional stories do. Okay? That's not to say that fiction is real, but there's, there's, there's bedrock principles that can be grasped through narrative. And I think we've lost that idea in Western culture. And Emerson's essay on history really helps you understand that. And as you start to understand these things, you start recognizing them in fiction, nonfiction, and it gives you a whole new perspective on it. I want to finally close out by talking about some books that have helped me become a better writer. Um, this one, Stephen King, he's as far as his, his purely his delivery, his technique, this guy's my favorite writer. I don't necessarily like the things he writes about but the way he writes is very um, it's very effective he actually thinks writing is like telepathy because you're communicating your idea from your mind to the other person's mind and I talk about that in my series on how to become a better writer but this is a great book also on the techniques of writing as far as I'm concerned if you only read one book on writing it should be this as you can see mine is worn out it's dog-eared it's marked up this is the best book on the technique the nuts and bolts of writing and if you're interested in becoming a better writer I have a series on my YouTube channel which which is called Seth Chairpack on writing where I explain the principles in this book and how to use them get this book if you're a writer period and then um, the last thing I want to close out with here is this book called with winning in mind by Lanny Bashan by the way sorry Jack Hart is the writer of a writer's coach Jack Hart so last thing is, last book is this guy, Lanny Basham. He's not terribly well known in the personal growth world. He is a Canadian, um, a Canadian um, Olympic shooter. Now, that was my dog that just made that noise. <laughs> he, um, you have to read this. It, it, it talks about how your performance is governed by your, your self-image and your self not your self-esteem, but your self-image, your conception of yourself, your self-valuation. The reason that's important is because no matter how good you get as a writer, your ability to actually use those skills when it counts 
is dependent on your self-image. And he explains exactly what he means in this book. And there are some very practical step-by-step -step formulas, things you can do to become better at using the skills you already have. The, and I know that there's a lot of garbage personal growth books that, that, that talk about self-image and they don't really give you any practical solutions. This guy does. This is a very good book. And the, the way I think about that is when, you know, there's a difference between the skills that you have and the skills that you use, especially the skills that you use under pressure. When I was performing as a um, pianist back in college, there were times when I would walk on stage and I felt like I lost half my ability because my state of mind changed in such a way to where I just couldn't perform the way I normally um, could under pressure. This guy talks about how that happens, how that choke happens and how to overcome it. So if you want to show up in your life as your whole and highest self and bring to the table all the skills and techniques that you've learned, all the experience, this is going to teach you how to do it. Um, so anyway, that's it. That's my whole reading list. I'm sure I've missed a couple of things that, that you might have even heard me talk about, but there's a lot of other books that have influenced my life that I, I can't think of all of them right now, and I'm sure there's going to be more ones. But if you really want to start dig, digging into this topic of understanding human behavior, human consciousness, how we make value judgments, how the outcomes in our lives are produced the way that we are, both on an individual basis and on a collective and societal basis, and how those things evolve over time and, and ultimately cause the human story to unfold, these are the books to get a hold of. If you grab any of these and you want to discuss them, I'd be happy to talk about them um, with you. Just subscribe to my YouTube channel. There's also a link below this video where you can find my website. You can follow me on, on Pinterest, on um, Twitter. Um, or join one of my Facebook groups. Again, this is Seth Chairpack. Thanks so much for watching my recommended reading list. And now you've got enough material to keep you busy for the next few years. Talk to you later.